So, sorry, that sounds a lot. So, I'm still Sophie. I'm from the University of Kent, and today I'll be talking about um, an analysis we've done on Ruby on Rails implications of more broadly on Google implications. But first, I want to explain to you well, why you really decided to carry on to conduct this analysis, and it's related to what we've done before. So, there are a um, good amount of work showing that actually the behavior of programs is not quite stable at runtime, right and that this behavior can be divided into distinct chunks of homogeneous behavior, and those chunks are little phases. So, if I take a concrete example, so think, you can think about the web server, the kind of server you would use to compute. Uh, statistics about the web server. So first, this server will analyze your requests, then compute statistics out of the files that your files you sent, and then it will generate blocks out of the statistics. And so, if we have a look at how this server names, then we can divide it into three high-level phases. The one where we analyze the request being the first phase, computing a statistics being second phase and the generation box in the third phase. So we have those three high-level phases. And those high-level phases have an impact on lower level or on the lower level behavior of um, well the program. So think for instance that when the whatever will analyze requests, but it will do it will fetch your file and maybe iterate through those files to pass it. And maybe during this particular phase, it will well, store those files into a set. So it will iterate through this set a significant amount. Then during the second phase, say that while well, all the results of your benchmark are stored in an array, one that points is an element of this array. And so the web server will iterate through this array. Those kind of arrays were quite a large amount of time. And during the plot generation, saying that the statistics have been no well stored in a hash map where the key is the benchmark, then it's likely that the web server will well, iterate through the hash map. And this, all those iteration operations will likely trigger a call in the standard library for to this for each call site. And this for each uh, call site, um, well, we have three types of receivers. So during the first phase, a set, during the second phase, an array, during the third, third phase, the hash map. And this will influence the content of the loop cache of this specific call site. And so, yeah, what I mean here is really that like high level behavior can have impact on lower level behavior. And also, well, and also the behavior is not quite stable at runtime. And those things usually go get common compiler assumptions. Well, not to be the one that says that um, the behavior is stable. And so we took benefit of this knowledge to develop so, uh, you know, an optimization called phase based splitting, where we use the knowledge of phases as a guide uh, to optimize. And so I will go into the details, but basically how this works. So here we have a simple program with two phases. So that's phase one, which is repeating ones, phase two, which is repeating ones as well. There are three different uh, lines on this spot. So the blue and red uh, lines for the same concept X, you have the same hashes through the whole execution, so that's just the same, like, the same concept of hash. But the thing is, during the second uh, phase two, you could benefit to, from having a hash with slightly different concepts. And so what we're doing with basically splitting, we trigger it on phase switch. And the result is that the hashes will have the content specialized to the current phase we're in. And this led to very promising results with around a speed of around 40% on this micro benchmark. But, well, there was only one micro benchmark, not on a big uh, on a research language. 
So we still don't know whether bigger applications would benefit from phase-based tracing. And more in detail, we don't know whether they actually have caches that could be further optimized. We don't know whether those bigger applications actually have phase behavior, so have ideal phases that we can identify uh, during that right time. And so we don't know whether they have phase behavior that could affect caches in a way that we could optimize them. And so that's uh, why we started to do the analysis. And so that's the question I'll, I'll try to answer during this. So first, let's start. Right, let's talk about the findings of our analysis. So here, try to, to answer the question: Do bigger applications have caches that could be further optimized? So our setup for this analysis, we um, switched to Truffle Ruby, which is uh, well, which has a richer benchmark set. And, Set of benchmarks that we can apply in the community, and also it's uh, a program, uh, language that is used uh, throughout the industry. So it's Ruby, so it's basically Ruby, really, really, uh, running on top of Ruby. Our benchmark sets contains both micro and macro benchmarks. Um, so the parts, so some of them comes from the uh, procure benchmark games, other have been developed by the Ruby community, or the Ruby and Ruby community. And we're only focusing on logical code. So, what did we analyze and what uh, did we learn actually? What did we use in our analysis? So, I said it was an analysis, an analysis of calls and behavior, so we are tracking calls. So, we've instrumented Travel Ruby call sites and closure application sites. And this is a small excerpt of one of the log file for the Delta benchmark. So in practice, we have one line or one call. And then we have, we log the next call location of um, this call. So here, if we have a look at the file, so at this line in the Delta we log out the file, we have the call. Um, then we have the middle of the symbol, so the name of the function that is being called. So here we have the original receiver type, so which is basically the type of the receiver we add this right method is the right one. Um, then you have the observed receiver type. I'll explain later why we are making a difference between original and observed receiver type. Here is the same, but we don't have to import the same type. And the last bit is the hash codes of the target that is being executed. And so the main behavior we are, we are analyzing is polymorphism. So remember that I want to know what, uh, what are in the caches, in the looping caches. So if you talk about Ruby, looping caches can have two states. So it can be either monomorphic where it's containing only one entry, that's the ideal fastest state. When it contains between two and eight entries, it's a polymorphic Google crash. And it contains more than eight entries, it's a monomorphic Google crash, and it's usually the slowest option. And well, we want to know whether our benchmark set and well generally whether well, Ruby applications have polymorphic or metamorphic Google crashes because that's the kind of caches that could benefit uh, likely from face-to-face um, tracing. Usually, those kind of a lot slower caches are not that frequent in um, applications, but this has never been investigated in the terms for Ruby, so let's find out. So, what do we have? Well, find out that actually methods are pretty cool. It's not like Huge, but still, there is one of them. So one bar is actually, so you have one bar is one benchmark. And um, it represents the total number of calls per uh, benchmark, and the blue bit represents the amount of polymorphic calls. So here, the biggest, well, the most polymorphic benchmark is the liquid one with around 25% of calls that are polymorphic. 
And then, so I would say that around half of the benchmark do have polymorphic um, calls, and then it's around, on average, the those benchmark have around the 15 persons of polymorphics. For closures, it's a bit different. Well, they are now polymorphic as well, but, well, in a different way. So still we have around half of our benchmark that are spay polymorphic cash behavior. And, but you can see that some of those benchmarks have a, are pretty much more polymorphic, uh, well, have a high proportion of polymorphics. So, okay, good, good, good. But uh, in this analysis, um, I haven't considered the optimizations that are already in place in Turfal Ruby to lower the degree of um, polymorphism. And so maybe those optimizations are already pretty um, performance efficient and they don't need to uh, use phase based casing. So here I'll have a look at two uh, optimizations. I will have, I have a look at the effect of target, addressing target polymorphism and at the effect of splitting, what well, is basically splitting, which is very good splitting. And so target polymorphism, what is it? So let's consider that you have this kind of class hierarchy where uh, B is the subclass of class A and that B is not overriding the full method. And let's consider a snippet of code uh, just on the right where you have these bounds methods where you can call foo on an object that could be better than an object class A or class B. So if I'm calling first bounds, on object on, on object A and then that's on an object B. What will happen to my full call site? Well, the full contains two, uh, the loop compression contains two entries, one for A, one for B. But they're pointing to the same target. So we don't need to have two entries in this cache. And uh, addressing target polymorphism tries to address this kind of situations. So and it's in place in front of Ruby. So this is super effective. So that's the results we had. So that's only four methods here. Yeah. So that's that's what we had. Uh, so that's the the, the charts we have from before. And let's add another target polymorphism. And so you can see that the the amount of polymorphic calls has drastically is drastically reduced, which is great. I guess for type polymorphism, not quite for famous splitting, but let's continue investigating. So I said I would, I would consider the effect of target, addressing target polymorphism and addressing the effect of splitting. So in theory, we would, we would like splitting to monomorphize polymorphic or monomorphic concepts. So this is, this is the um, plots with target polymorphism being addressed, so the one we just saw, and when we're applying vector splitting, then it's reducing further the degree of polymorphism in our branch boxes. And on the delta blue remains, well, well kind of polymorphic, but with around 12% of polymorphic calls, and all the other are less than, and less than 5% of polymorphic calls. So, there is something else, though, that we considered. It's the spin transitions. So basically, consider that you have a call site, say that it is polymorphic, so basically it has two caches in its, uh, two entries in its local cache. You split it, so the local cache is exact, and then this new cloned cache, uh, this new call, cloned call site is executed, and so at some point it will become again more lovely or more. And we've analyzed these transitions. So we've analyzed the state of the call site before and after splitting. So the ideal case is when you have a media or a polymorphic call site that turns monomorphic or maybe a monomorphic call site turning polymorphic. But there are much more transitions that could happen. And this ugly state machine states uh, graph represented. But so, 
realize those transitions on our benchmark set. Lots of members, you don't need to read them all. The only thing you have to, the only two thing you have to overlook here is this one. So the transition is you have monomorphic to monomorphic. So you have a monomorphic oxide containing one entry has been split, and then it's uh, the, the cloning bit uh, is still executed, and the small equal uh, on the right uh, part is saying that the receiver well, or the cache is containing the same target. And so here you can see that actually this kind of transition is pre. Frequent is the, uh, is the most important one. And the ideal one I was tearing, uh, talking about earlier is this one. And well, it's still happening, but pretty uh, less frequent. So, what can we take away from all this? Well, first, that method polymorphism is already kind of mainly taken care of by the optimizations that are in place. Closures, despite those optimizations, are still pretty polymorphic and might benefit from further optimizations. And also from the call site perspective, splitting could be also further guided. So you have to take this last bit with a grain of salt. Because um, so it's really from the call site perspective, and of course the system is much more complex than that. I only have to talk about this uh, later. But okay, so that's what we can take away from the analysis, for example. If you remember well, there were several questions in this one. There were only I tried to answer this one. And but there is this other question that we can try to address in parallel. So those of those bigger applications have crazy behavior. And so that's what we try to do. We try to look for phases. And we focus on our web applications, and here just a simple blog application that is generated out of the box with Google Browse. And we consider three different kind of well behavior those applications have that may generate phases. Um, and so those three kind of behaviors are web rooms, locating and initialization. We follow we only consider it uh, the web rooms uh, case. So a web route is typically an HTTP method plus a path plus a method ending a path. And so what we try to do with our blog application is we try to send to a 100 get method, uh, get requests on the same blog post, and then 100 get requests on a different, uh, on a different uh, path, which was basically a summary of all the blog posts. And so we were trying to see whether we could see an impact of this artificially generated face behavior on a uh, call set behavior. And we <laughs> so, uh, this is just an example. This is one of the high, uh, high level, most called uh, call, polymorphic call sets uh, in, uh, in the network. And basically, all, all the call, all the call set behavior are in the like So we have. Basically, you have one dot kind of corresponding to one call. Uh, each, so I'm sorry, this is really uh, small. But in red, you have receiver A, in blue, you have receiver B, and one dot is equal to one call, either receiver B is all receiver A, and that's all one call. So, so, okay, so that didn't work. So we tried another combination. So we tried now instead of only manipulating manipulating the path, we manipulated the HTTP method and the path. And so we sent it a hundred requests on the same blog post, and then we sent it a hundred post requests, so we can carry requests on a well, it's for your uh, path to create to add a new post into the database, and this is generating phase behavior. So again, uh, sorry. So this is not a, so again, this is just one call site, one highly executed call site in this run. And if we compare that to a run where we're not trying to create a phase behavior, and this phase behavior is not 
that really artificial gradient, you could do a lot of yeah, press for different kind of things. Then you can see that there is a, a, a sharp difference here. And this difference appears in quite a lot of contacts. So here there's a lot of contacts which is um, executed a lot where you have the same uh, difference. Here, no contacts with the same kind of behavior. And so we still, we're still not 100% sure what is the cause of this. Well, we know that's because there are high level phases in the global, uh, in the application, but uh, we haven't had time to investigate further. So that's uh, the next uh, task in our to list. There are other, other kind of things that still need to be done, especially in the analysis part. So I said that the analysis of splitting transitions, well, for now it's still a bit naive. And it would be really interesting to consider the call side a, a wider context. So right now we are only considering one context when we are having the next meeting. It would be kind of interesting to have a look at the caller as well. Um, something else uh, that could be interesting is to investigate so like direct, indirect polymorphism, especially for closures, because usually you can um, send a closure in the parameter and the, par the polymorph and just like in my, uh, in, in my example, then you could execute this closure that has been passed as far as you have polymorphism stemming from, from this. And although no, this case is not um, detected as a pretty opportunity, we don't know whether this pattern is uh, common uh, and whether we, we manage to use phases to detect it, but then yeah, why not? And um, there is also something I would be quite interested to investigate is whether we could find ideal splitting points. So again, um, having a, um, a run with no splitting operation, having a look at the behavior at close sites, kind of identify the, the, the points that were, would be ideal to split, we can be ideal to speak and compare it to what is done uh, at the moment and see whether well, we can close the gap if there is a gap. And well, that's basically all. So, what you should remember from this talk is that we know that phase guided optimizations well, performed well in small experiments, but um, we don't know whether we could find such a nice setup to optimize in the real program. So that's the reason we try to analyze a uh, bigger and uh, we used to uh, use your for Ruby and uh, try to analyze bigger applications. We found that closure are still and splitting are still good candidates. And well there are still of course a lot of ex exciting things to consider just like with your wider context, with your polymorphic, indirect polymorphism, ideal split, split points, but of course, investigates the reason why we got phase behavior in the algorithm process. Thank you. Thank you.